Hello, welcome to The Crownsman Show. I'm your host, Jared Downey. Today, we have Centresis and CNP featured. Um, we'll talk about how that's all connected shortly. We've got three guests on, and um, I was just I just spent some time on their YouTube channel. We're going to put a link to that in the description because uh, just some of the information and videos are, are fun to watch. But we have three guests that are sort of going to unpack... Um, you know, w within the length of the show, we won't get to cover everything, but we'll pack as much as we can in. We've got Michael Copper. He is their president and CEO of Centresis CNP. And then we've got Gerhard Forstner. Uh, he is the president at CNP. And then Josh Gable. He's the sales director at Centresis and CNP. So, gentlemen, welcome to the show. Great to have you all on. Nice meeting you. Thanks for having us. Um, Thank okay. you. Yeah, it's... Yeah, it, it, there's like I said uh, in the intro, uh, just even spending a little bit of time on your YouTube channel, I was thinking, well, we're not going to be able to put a huge dent in it, but we'll pack as much as we can in. So, Michael, can we start with you? Just give us the overview of, well, let's start with Centresis. Who who is, are you as a company? Centresis, a mid-sized company, was started in 1987 as a repair and service facility. We repair, at that time, centrifuges, decanter centrifuges for every market, for every brand, because there was a big need in the U.S. And I made a choice to live in the U.S. rather than being born here. So I made that choice because I enjoyed the lifestyle here. So we started in 87 to repair machines, service machines. And um, in 98, people asked us, basically, why don't you have your own equipment? So Centresis formed new equipment. We built started to build new equipment and our first customer for the city of Honolulu, anybody want to go there. And um, so innovative, we have done more and more different markets. We have started with different markets from municipal. We have all kind of industrial market from any food processing, any um, mining, and we have done all kind of different markets. As of today, we added CNP as a process company mm. about that was probably about 2013 or so as a process company to help us to improve as well as improve the performance overall because the CNP products improve the performance on the centrifuges as well as increase the market share and being experts in solid reduction and waste reduction. And in the meantime, as of today, we are still a mid-sized company and we we basically formed slightly different as we have originally been 90 percent municipal mm. as of today we are between municipal and industrial market where we are about a 50 50 share wow but but everything in that municipal market we learned we transferred for industrial because industrial had the same problem than the municipal market and um Everything we learned in one place, we can transfer to the other place. So that's where we are as of today. Did that, um, that getting uh, from increasing the industrial uh, from the municipal, did that, has that been an, just an increase in industrial to get to that space? It has been increase of industrial, correct. Yeah. yeah. Because that market was added so far as. Right. Did um, it, maybe. Uh, Gerhard, uh, now I just butchered your name. I'm sorry. How do you say your name? I, it's in my head now. It happens on the show. Oh, Everybody loves you. You did correct, Gerhard. Gerhard. Very good, yeah, Gerhard. It's because I was practicing Perfect. it wrong before the show, so now I can't. I to keep thinking I've got it wrong. Um, Gerhard, can you can you just expand on CNP a little bit more? Yes. Uh, so Mike already alluded to it, right? So CNP stands for carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So CMB, if you will, is a process company for Centresis. Imagine Centresis is building the big machinery, mm -hmm. is there has a lot of expertise in, in manufacturing. And Michael had this vision back then, he said 2013, which is correct, to found CMB. Uh, the goal was to really give Centresis another arrow in their quiver to really go after complete process systems, mm -hmm. which are obviously critical for industries. You know, people want to know, they want a solution. They don't want just a the machine. They want, if you have a problem in the industry, let's say you have high phosphorus concentrations, right? They come, they can come to us and say, what do you have? How can you help us? And so what CMP does, uh, we do really um, carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus. We do uh, one process where we convert uh, biological matter into um, solub solubilized for anorectic digestion, so you have more biogas. So that was, goes for renewable energy, for example. 
floor plans. And the other uh, foot we have in is phosphorus removal and recovery. So we have seven industries which have high phosphorus loading rates, uh, distilleries, uh, a, um, animal byproducts, we have ethanol, uh, we have biodigester facility. All these facilities have eventually problems with fo high phosphorus loads, which are, you know, may be able to give them maintenance problems or they may not need a permit. And that's, I think, that's where CMB comes in and ties it together when we can approach a customer and say, hey, here is not just the machinery, but there's a process solution. We can do lab tests. We can say, okay, this is what we can guarantee you. I think that's why Mike had the foresight to really bring that into our fold here. Let's talk about our heavy industry tour brought to you by Savannah Equipment, supplying mining equipment worldwide. We are heading to events across North America, Africa, and Australia, and filming episodes on location. Email us at info at crownsman.com to be part of Crownsman's heavy industry world tour. Based in Southern California, Enhanced Scanning has performed thousands of projects on construction sites across the U.S. in an effort to help its customers find the unfindable. Enhanced Scanning combines ground-penetrating radar, laser scanning, and drone inspection services to provide comprehensive deliverables for their customers' fast-paced timelines, all without sacrificing quality or communication. To learn more, you can visit them at EnhancedScanning.com or find them on LinkedIn at Enhanced Scanning. OptiSize is a leading-edge geophysical acquisition design and software company. OptiSize provides innovative seismic survey designs utilizing the latest field technology and optimizing for advanced processing and quantitative interpretation techniques. OptiSize's mission is to bring sustainable exploration solutions to energy development with their custom land footprint reduction technology, EcoSize. EcoSize enables operators to focus on reducing their environmental and greenhouse gas footprint while imaging all their subsurface targets and reducing costs. You can visit them at OptiSize.com to learn more. I have a question for you. Just in, Were you the founder of the company? Yes, sir. So, um, so you said you started in 87 then. Did the industry just pull you? Did customer demand? Or, or when you started, were you thinking, oh, I'll have a nice little service business? What, what was sort of the thought process? 80, since well, 87, the, that's quite a few the years. Thought process, the thought process in that regard was more in the beginning. It was more in there was a need in the United States at that time in the centrifuge industry for having service because the market is basically penetrated by mostly European companies. Okay. We had two U.S. companies here. They got out, they got bought out by European. And so, and I was over here for a, your, one of the European company. And I said, this is a perfect market for, this, for a service industry. Mm. And as it evolved, there were more needs. And that's why we started manufacturing. We started uh, process solutions and also innovative Innovative technology, I mean, probably we mentioned later on a couple of them where we have some innovative thing going from waste to energy. And that is certain things we have done. And the vision there was only originally just service and repair. Um, I should let the audience know, by the way, this is part one. I think you're doing three or four two or three more with us. So this is there's going to be some more high-level uh, questions and, and some very specific ones as well. Um, but I, I guess one question I'd have for you, again, just because you know, the audience, they're, they're going to be the entrepreneurs and, and all types of business people that watch the show. What, out of that state, from 87 to, to now, um, what, what was the biggest sort of leap that you had to make as a company over those years? The biggest leap on a personal side was getting less involved mm. with the details and uh, concentrating on the big picture. On the um, on the business side, getting my crew up basically was in the municipal side and realizing that the industrial side is as important, even more important mm. for the industry. And that's what we have done, develop equipment for the industrial side. Uh, one of the big steps was and uh, in the mining. The mining industry worldwide has a problem with lagoons and um, eliminating tailings and things like this and recovering more products. Uh, that's when the, the big change had been taking place. Josh, I want to bring you in now because I want to swing it around um, from the just for some more of the customer viewpoint. Obviously, the environmental side is a big part of where you plug into the industry. Can you walk us through... Uh, maybe just even the challenges that your clients are facing, what you're hearing on the ground, um, 
and then dovetail that into, you know, and we'll, we'll bring everybody in to talk about sort of where those gaps, where you plug those gaps for clients. Yeah, sure. Sounds good. Uh, and, you know, I think the, probably the most, the number one issue that, you know, we're, we're helping customers solve is reducing the, uh, the amount of material that folks are handling. In a lot of cases, that's a waste product that has to go to a landfill. Um, it could be, it could be a, something else it could be, it, but at the end of the day, moving water around is expensive. And so if you can reduce the amount of liquids that are going along with those solids, you can save, uh, folks a lot of money. So that's probably the number one thing. And I mean, that tie, again, I mentioned landfill and, you know, we work with some specific customers like the waste managements of the world where we are, you know, going in and, and dewatering it dewatering their material or maybe you know, working with them in some other capacities to reduce the solids going in or working with people that work that are, that are using that company or others like them to, you know, to, to free up more volume in those landfills. I don't know, Michael, maybe you can expand a little bit on that. And we had a big project down in San Antonio. We were, we were working on the, on the landfill for waste management at the time. And what we had all field waste coming in. Historically, they have taken oil field waste, add solid waste into it. Out of one ton, they created three tons, and they buried now three tons of waste in the landfill. And we offered them a new solution. Sorry, could you expand? We, what we you, can. Sorry, I just want to uh, just they. I, I think I missed something. So they take one ton of of solid waste and turn it into three tons of liquid waste is that of solid of... waste of solid waste yeah what it comes the liquid the, the waste comes in as a kind of a liquid they mix it with more solids and out of that one ton they received from the f from the oil field they created a total of three tons basically adding two tons of <laughs> solids oh into it to yeah. bury it okay all right. all right yeah the reason being they have to make it stable so that uh you right. know it you know, yeah. that it'll, the landfill can handle it, essentially. But you had a better way. I, I'm, I'm going to take it we, that you had a better way. We had a better way. We then reduced that one ton to a third of the ton. So now they have, instead of bearing three tons, they buried a third of a ton. In addition, we recovered oil and water where the oil can be sold on the used oil market as a product. And this way, they could finance the whole project uh, as a service from us. With Fender Dunlop, you know you are getting the best conveyor belting in the market. That's because they ensure the integrity of their conveyor belting by monitoring each step of the manufacturing process in their North American facilities. Focused attention is given to each belting order to guarantee that they produce a belt that will assist the customer in reducing operation costs, maximizing uptime, and improving revenue. Visit FenderDunlopAmericas.com to learn more. LNH Industrial can custom engineer and build from the ground up any heavy equipment assembly or machine that you need for your operation. Their worldwide 24-7 field services network is on the job whenever you need heavy equipment troubleshooting, repairs, rebuilds, relocations, or replacements. And thanks to their specialized design and engineering and state-of-the-art manufacturing and repair services, they are a go-to international supplier for improved components and custom assemblies for heavy industrial machinery. Visit lnh.net to learn more. Xeronox is leading the electrification of off-highway commercial and industrial vehicles. They provide a platform for clean energy technology to get to market through powertrain solutions, development partnerships, and electrification kit solutions for conversions. Reduce carbon emissions without diminishing vehicle performance or being restricted by high costs. Partner with Zero Knox, like many of the world's leading OEMs as they solve challenges across multiple continents with their cleaner and higher performing technology. Zero Knox solutions are designed and engineered in America with offices in Porterville, California. Learn more at zeronox.com. Okay, this is actually, I, I'm glad you used that example because this, um, and, and maybe all three of you from different points of the company can answer this question. Is I'm always curious, especially companies like yours who really specialize in, in, in offering solutions in a very specific need for a client. How educated are, like, like a municipality, are they fairly educated on what they need? Whereas in this case, uh, the, this, this oil operator wasn't, they didn't, they were doing it the exact opposite way of, of a way, a solution that you found. Is that common? Um, what is sort of the communication and the understanding from the industry of, of the the different solutions there actually are out there. Maybe Mike, I'll, I'll let you continue, and then. But I'd like to hear everybody's perspective on it. So, if you really look at this, this is our playing field. 
because we are innovative. We have different ideas how to do things. And um, another ex similar example was that uh, this is falling in a municipal site, but it's also for industrial. We had a biosolids and we basically created a process with them. And the city was very in very interesting of doing so and they were working with us on the team which is a tough thing to do in a municipality but what we did we created out of the waste from a waste from a wastewater treatment plant that could be industrial that could be municipal this in case it was municipal and it's in our r d facility here in kenosha because the plant we use as an r d facility we created a product which were a class i a biosolids and all the energy came out from the waste. The waste, what Gerhard explained earlier, was digested. We used the gas to produce power. As a matter of fact, we produce more power than the process need. We then realized all the heat, which is a byproduct, to try the sludge from about a 30% solids to 94% solids. And all that energy came from the sludge itself. So we see basically, when a toilet is flushed, Eventually, we can get some energy out of it and can create a product. And in addition, from the five, from the 700 kilowatt that we produced, only 200 kilowatts were used in the process. So we had an addition of 500 positive energy, 500 kilowatt positive energy. That is per hour. Wow, Gerhard, I, I saw you uh, making a note there. Uh, do you want to expand on that? Same, same question. Yes, yes. That that actually was a, a wonderful project and. First of all, you, we don't even like the term wastewater. There, there is no waste in wastewater. You know, when you look at these streams and whether they're industrial or, or municipal, you have energy, you have nutrients, and you have water. Mm. So the goal obviously would be to separate those streams, right, for any industry so we can beneficially reuse what we have. In Kenosha, what Michael described is we use that um, uh, sludge, we broke the cells, we increased digestion, we, brought, we ran it to... Um, combined heat and power units, which provided the energy and the thermal energy to take the solids from, we started out at 1%. And what Michael described, the class A product, we went to 93%. Mm. So now everybody can appreciate when we talk about solids reduction, right? A, we reduced the volume and weight dramatically, but we also generated a positive energy of this process. So all this energy contained in this solid, in this 1%, allowed us to thicken the solids, dewater the solids, dry the solids, and also produce 25% more biogas, which then was converted to run their pumps, you know, CHP, electricity, and thermal energy to process all the solids. So we know, whether it's in municipal, uh, industrially, that a lot of people struggle with, with waste streams. If we are able, we can help to separate those and really generate an ROI for the materials what up to this date that was considered to be a waste you so know so we, we can help there and uh, i think i'm going back to your first question jared so the educational level mm. municipally and industrial so there is certainly a we feel like a great need right for people to educate them about technologies out there yeah and i don't think there's a big difference between municipal and industrial even you know engineers everybody has their specialty field but i think um we really always feel like when we when we able to talk to people and get all these questions, there's a great need of keeping educating people, and that's what we try to do. Josh, I want to bring you on this question because I, I one thing is nice. Now you have the term, you have the title sales director, which is great because so many companies now <laughs> you don't know who the actual salesperson is in the conversation. But we, I actually know, so I know that likely you're out there actually talking and fielding a lot of those first questions people have. You're trying to communicate what you offer, and I'm very curious because if you're selling. You know, a very standard product, this is it, it's built better than the competition or it's cheaper than the competition, you know, and then they decide. That That's fairly straightforward. What you're doing is you're having to educate and figure out their, their problem at the same time. But if you're offering a solution or saying we can offer a solution that's maybe not common in the market, that comes with its own complexity. So I'm really curious from your perspective, sort of that boots on the ground of those initial conversations, where clients are at when the conversation first starts. Yeah, thank you, Jared. I, I tell you, it can be a pretty varied um, uh, experience out there talking to different entities. Uh, um, I can tell you this though, because we're involved with so many different types of businesses uh, and, and 
facilities that are out there, we do have exposure to a lot of different solutions that people are looking to implement or try. And so, you know, inadvertently, we are able to share our field experiences and the things we see out there with new customers when they come around and we can help them be more creative with solutions to fixing their problems. Um, I, you know, I also wanted to go back to just briefly a mention with uh, the Kenosha project that Michael and Gerhard elaborated on uh, some of the technologies that Centresis and CNP brought to the, the table in that uh, project that made it all possible. Um, first and foremost, the technology that enabled uh, Centresis to really grow to where it is today, which is our dewatering centrifuge. Um, that That's a great story of it was the first piece of equipment we put into the Kenosha treatment facility. Um, and it had a very quick payback for the, for the, for the plant. Uh, I think it was something like less than uh, two years because wow. they were spending so much on the, the existing dewatering infrastructure they had. And there's our thickening centrifuges, the THK series. Um, and that really brings, going back to environmental issues that we're trying to solve, um, the THK makes the, 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 the whole solid handling process at that plant more efficient by reducing water that has to be treated in their anaerobic digester system and then all the downstream processes there, thereafter. Uh, that ties right into the CNP process, um, uh, Pondus, which we put into the Kenosha project as well. Our THK thickening centrifuge and Pondus work in tandem to make that anaerobic digester more efficient. And then uh, we implemented a sludge dryer technology, Centresis dryer is the DLT series. Uh, and that product uh, takes the dewater material uh, that comes out of our dewatering centrifuge and takes it to 90% solids uh, coming out of the plant. And that's where you get that really big reduction in, in um, uh, volume that you have that ultimately is either going to go to a landfill or hopefully can be beneficially reused. Uh, again, another environmental issue that we're trying to solve is trying to take these resources coming from waste facilities and getting them to be beneficially used somewhere else. I think this would be a good time now to then pivot over because you're sort of touching on it, Josh, is, well, we're talking about offering new solutions, essentially, and integrating and integrating your solutions into one system. The R&D on this, I'm very curious, maybe, Michael, we'll start with you, um, is is the R&D side of it. Is, is R&D for you as the needs come in, or do you go and you see municipalities, you see the industrial systems, and you go, okay, this is a common problem. We already know it. Let's start researching it. And then before we start asking people or offering our services, how do you approach that? I mean, these are major. I mean, water is a major <laughs> expense for companies as part of their systems. How do you, you approach see, the R&D for it? You see, one thing the R&D we do on it is based what we see, what we have learned historically. I mean, and not one shoe fits all mm -hmm. because everything is different. Every, every problem that people have is different and we have to design something that fits their shoe. Like I give you in the, um, in the mining side, give you a good example in that regard. We knew relatively little about coal mining, all right? And so in the mining side, we found a, a a problem that a lot of fine coal has been thrown away historically, put in big lagoons, and they're just oxidizes. That means the coal goes bad, together with tailings and so on. So together with um, with our with our friends at Somerset, we developed the concept where we can recover that fine coal, reduce less solids in big lagoons, which lagoons in in the whole world are a problem, waste lagoons. We, re we reduce the waste into the lagoons and we created a product which is benefit can be beneficially used. In that case, when you talk about ROI, that ROI is incredible because that in, in the in the coal mine industry, that ROI was close to about a year, which is incredible. But it's the product is different. We basically, A, we recover the product, we put less waste in it, and we clean the water as water is always used in a circle that has to be reused. Mm -hmm. And if I can start up with a re clean, re reused water, I have the, the three factor reduction, improvement, less solids, and clean water in the, as a reuse for continuously. Do you have, uh, 
um, and Gerhard, maybe this would be a good question for you. Now with with CNP, do you are you circling back on some of these systems that you've serviced, maybe put into service? I don't know, maybe ten years ago, and and going back to them and saying, okay, we've expanded our offering. We can offer another level of service. Yes, we 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 do that. Um, I'm not sure if ser- service in terms of technology, right, Jared? Do you understand yeah. this? Yes. Yes, exactly. So what we see very often is um, certainly on the municipal side, which industrial uh, plants are impacted as well. Obviously, regulations change, right? Mm, right? Nutrient regulations, discharge regulations change. Right now, there's a big push on reducing phosphorus discharge and nitrogen discharge. So let's say we put in a system like Josh described, our bundles process, which is a uh, breaks down um, biological sludge to make it more digestible. So, you know, the end benefit would be to get more biogas. The difference in, it, in biogas generation means less organic matter in the dewatering step. So now, since this same, a lot of the same places now face these phosphorus regulations, obviously we revisit those customers and say, look, here we have a solution for you. We can help you to mitigate your nutrient loading rates, meaning phosphorus, partially nitrogen, we can reduce that for you. There is this trust which we have with these clients, right? Because we were the trusted advisors. The system in Kenosha, Michael described, is in operation for nine years. So there's a lot of goodwill and a lot of people that they, they, they have trust in us and they're open to discussing this new solution. And obviously, we really thrive on the direct customer contact because we're solution providers, right? We like to work direct with industries because we feel like we can go to them and say, I understand the problem and we have not just the machinery, but also the process associated with that. So to short answer, yes, absolutely, right? We try to go uh, visit those customers and, and introduce them to our new innovation, which we have, whether it's a DHK or a phosphorus recovery or a trial. Michael, anything to add? Well, I just want to add something. We, we talk about um, legislation change and things like this. Just to, to clear out why it is so important to remove the phosphates out of out of the water stream. All the water streams are being discharged into a lake or into a river. And as more phosphate we have, you heard about algae plume. And so th- that phosphate in the wastewater create algae either in the river or on the lakes. And that's why the legislation is minimizing it. And eventually we were going to make it effective enough that we don't have that algae plume anymore, as well as we can a product which we can recover, which is uh, not necessarily worldwide forever available by recovering the phosphate. The phosphates, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Josh? Yeah, I wanted to add in on on working with existing customers. I think, you know, we talk about solving regulatory issues, but uh, for some of our uh, clients, it's more about, you know, making sure that their operation is profitable. Mm-hmm. And over time, certain, you know, all industries are going to evolve and the economics of those industries are going to evolve. So looking at things like ethanol or the paper industry, for example, um, you know, we, we may have had equipment in with a specific customer for a long period of time, maybe dealing with a wastewater stream as an example. Um, but now we're going back out to those clients and talking to them about how we can re- recover uh, valuable secondary products from their process. Um, again, a centrifuge, our, our core product can be used in many applications for separating solids and liquids. And in a lot of cases, that means recovering value added products. It could be uh, CTO crude tall oil from a paper white wastewater stream or a paper or paper waste stream, uh, or it could be uh, you know some type of high protein or high fat uh, product in an ethanol industry, um, and you know going back to what Michael was talking about with uh, the coal application, for a very long time folks were just throwing that fine coal away, and here we are recovering it, and it's a very uh, very lucrative. Uh, product that they can then sell to uh, steel mills uh, to make, you know, to keep keep U.S. steel booming, as an example. Is is the equipment and process sort of that merging of the two um, that, that Centresis and CNP have, has that, is, is that common in the industry? Um, anybody who wants to answer that? I, I'll answer that. I feel, I think that it's, it's pretty unique um, to have uh, the, the the equipment side and the process side. I mean, um, there are a lot of companies out there selling centrifuges. I wouldn't say a lot, but there's a number of cent- big centrifuge manufacturers out there, which sell other solid liquid separation equipment also. But it's 
not as common to find somebody that's trying to, you know, vertically integrate the, the process solutions like we are in integrating the technologies into the bigger picture. Um, Michael and Gerhard, maybe I'll, I'll ask both of you this. What has been, um, were there any challenges uh, when, when you sort of merged these two things together um, for an offering to a client? Or was it, pretty, was it pretty clear there was a demand for it when you, did, when you made those decisions? Well, it, I think it was pretty clear the demand is there. And that's why we said the improvement of the processes we added to the equipment manufacturer was for us an idea, number one, by doing so, the performance of our centrifuge improved. Meaning basically, if I can remove phosphate, the cake solids from a centrifuge improve. If I can, um, if I can hydrolyze the cells, the, the operation of the centrifuge is easier as well. So that was the direct direct connection and said, well, it all fits together. But, um, I, and that's where I think it was, it was actually very easy to integrate the two products together. It took us longer than we thought it will take. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, you know, in a lot of industries, it's, it took much longer than we expected it will take, but I think we are, have a good momentum going at this time. And, uh, I see a good future in it, but it took it took longer than I thought it would take. Why? What? What were some of the sort of the the holdbacks when well, trying to do it? The acceptance of the of the clients that it can be done. The acceptance. Right. It's a new product, and it's not. It was developed by an, a company that is manufacturing equipment. It was not like a, an R and D and design company. Right. We did it because of necessity for us. And we did it as necessity for the customers. So it took a little bit longer to get it approved in the market to get the market to respond to it. So that was not easy. Yeah, Gerhard, Everybody, I, like, I saw you smiling. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, I, I have to, you know, like on record, you have to thank Mr. Copper, Mikey, you know, to fund this adventure, right? So because one of the beautiful things I believe is what, what makes us so strong is we have a very flat hierarchy. Like the three people on here, those are the three people talking daily. When we make a decision, it happens very quickly. Michael makes this, these decisions. There's not, you know, a comedy or anything. And the same went in that Michael was willing to invest in this future, which he saw with CMP. And it worked out extremely well. But like Michael said, it took some patience. So if we would be a private equity kind of deal, you know, it would be... I don't know if the right. if the prep have been that long. <laughs> Michael's laughing. Josh is smiling. Yeah, Josh, what from your perspective? It's I, I'm sure it was interesting for you taking it into the market and and having those conversations. Uh, it certainly was. I mean, I think uh, what I wanted to say was, you know, it's there's a lot of people that are super excited about new technology, very interested. But there's a lot less people that are actually willing to invest. Yeah, in as soon as you technology. said a lot of people are interested, I was thinking, yeah, there's a lot less people willing to actually do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it's 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 you got to do a lot of groundwork to build trust and and faith in in the customer with those customers to get somebody to take the leap with you. And uh, thankfully, we've we've been able to to do that. And ultimately, that boils down to uh, you know the reputation that we do already have in the marketplace as a centrifuge manufacturer. Um, a lot of times we're looking to try something new. The first, first people we're going to go talk to is somebody that we've been working with for a long time already. Mm -hmm. um, I can add something yes, to that please. if you don't mind. Yes. I mean, we have down in um, Alabama and a big coal mine warrior, we have about right now 17 solid ball decanters installed. The interesting thing was these machines put the summer set together. The machines worked so well that when Warrior came and said, we wanted a new machine, something completely different, Centresis, you have never done. Would you be willing to do this? And we got the order for six large machines to do this because they trusted that we, building even a new concept of a machine, will wow. be able to do it compared to others who have, have built those machines historically. That's amazing. That is actually yeah. an amazing thing to get that sort of trust from a client. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I want to add on that a little bit. So that's a, it's a really important thing to mention about Centresis is uh, one of the things that really sets us apart from other manufacturers in the centrifuge marketplace specifically is our willingness and ability to customize solutions for some of the world's toughest applications for decanter centrifuges. And the Somerset application is a really good example of that. Um, and, you know, another one would be in the dairy and manure business uh, where we're, you know, selling into canter centrifuge, that machine that's 
you know, a mainstay in that in that application uh, was developed kind of iteratively over time, but it is, you know, a customized machine specifically catering to the needs and the tough wear and tear that uh, they're going to see in that industry. Um, but if another customer comes to us and says, hey, we need to do this, well, taking all that knowledge that we've learned from all these other applications, we can incorporate those things into a new design that's going to meet their needs. And you know, then after they've run for a few years, we can bring it back in, do a repair. And if there are specific things that need to be addressed to make it last longer or perform a little better, we can make those changes. And then if there are further opportunities in the future, we can incorporate those changes or modifications into new designs as well. Um, yeah, thank you. I wanted to, before, you know, as soon as we get into the tail end, there's something I want to, you, were, you, you, everybody was sort of, we're talking about regulations, um, but we just kind of passed over and I want to circle back to it, um, for your business and, and operations, um, that with new regulations coming in, that must have had al- almost an explosion of demand for some of your, your products and services, I would assume. You're correct. Yeah. I mean, we call the EPA as our friends as because, A, they take care about the environment, they have rules and regulations. And for us, as a mid-sized company, we like these challenges to develop new products, develop different things to put us in the forefront of the environmental cleanups everywhere. And it's a lot of, has it been a lot of new, maybe Josh, a lot of new business opportunity as those regulations are coming into play? Well, I'll say certainly um, on the municipal side with CNP, you know, the the company uh, and our technology matrix probably would not exist in the U.S. if it was not for phosphorus regulations being implemented over the last 10 to 20 years. And for sure, those the implementation of those regulations is continuing. Uh, you know, it started with some of the front runner states that tend to be a little more proactive with um with regulation and now it's you know it's spreading out and being implemented more more on the whole across the country uh and so we have obviously seen more momentum with with our cnp and our nutrient recovery technologies as a result of that but i think you know the other thing re- related to this is um you know new maybe not regulations yet but there's a lot of there's a lot of discussion out there in the marketplace about pfos pfoa um, as an emerging contaminant, there are some regulations going into play right now, and everybody's got their guard up, at least in the municipal business. And I'm sure there, you know, a lot of industries are, you know, in some way utilizing, you know, these types of chemicals or possibly manufacturing it. Um, and, and so they are also concerned about this. And so what that's doing is it's, it's making it more difficult and increasing the risk associated with getting rid of solids that are coming from your facility. And so um, anything you can do to minimize the amount of solids that you're producing by getting rid of excess water uh, is going to have a a big uh, cost. Well, it's going to help minimize risk substantially and potentially save costs, a lot of costs in the future. So uh, it's driven up landfill expenses or landfilling tipping fees and things like that. And that's that's certainly led to a, a big uptick in um, interest in our centrifuges, but also our you know our new dryer technology, the DLT. Yeah, and I think on the, some of the other episodes, we're going to expand further on. Um, I, I don't know if you're doing an a, a agriculture show, but we're going to be covering. Um, expanding on it a lot more. I've got two questions, uh, Gerhard, for you and, and Michael, uh, the last one for you. So, Gerhard, I'm going to start with you. You, you mentioned the patience um, that it, it took to get C- CNP to, to where, I mean, it's still growing, but where you, you know, market ready and integrated into the services and all that sort of thing. Um, what was that... Y- you know, and I, I realize we're on, we're on a show talking about it, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but but just maybe more the mindset that you had to have. Um, you know, you you want to do it quickly, but you also need to do it right. Um, you know, you're it's a tat to centrisis, so there's a there's a brand expectation of what needs to be delivered and and to keep that brand you know integrity and all that. that that's actually quite a bit of pressure. I'm just wondering what your process and your mindset was like while doing that development. In this industry, all my jobs have been jobs where I had to build a business, more or less, right? Mm. So I'm used to that. That goes back 20 years ago. And right before I joined Centrisis, I was CEO of a startup company. I see. So so I understand the pressure really right. well. 
And that was mentioned, the private equity deal, right? It was a different environment. There was money and there's a, you know, a very short timeline and yeah. you kind of ran out of time. And the difference at St. Teresa's was, I mean, I had the passion. I, I, I enjoyed uh, what I knew about St. Teresa's, Michael. I met Josh. So that felt really, really good. And I wanted to be part of that. And I'm a competitive person in nature, right? And I love, I love the interaction with people, love, te- love solving technical problems. But uh, what was unique about this role at CMP, I didn't have to worry about going on road shows and trying, you know, raise additional capital. Yeah. So that that what Michael was here for, and he always assured me he was always standing behind CMP and our team. So I was free to really focus on going out, right, promoting the technology, like what we talked about, getting a market adaption. We put it in Kenosha, and that really has helped. So my goal is really the b- big. You know, the, the, the trauma, getting this technology uh, better known within the industry without having to worry. I mean, it's not quite true, but without having to worry about where the next paycheck is coming from, yeah. from for us and the team. Yeah, I know what you mean. That uh, I was, well, as you were answering, I was thinking there's some startup people right now that are very jealous. <laughs> They're going, <Yeah>. really? <laughs> That's not fair. Um, but it, right. it, it's how it really is a big part of how. More products would be into the market successfully with that approach. And then, Michael, the last question for you um, is, you said at the beginning of the interview, um, uh, essentially learning to let go of the the details. Um, I'm going to guess, um, even the the fact that you're just on the interview, you're very engaged, that that's an ongoing process, (laughs) letting go of the details. It's it's a never-ending story, but um, I am not as patient as Gerhard Forstner is. Because uh, we have to, we have to come up with all the ideas as well as the the finances for everything. Yeah. So it is it is different for me, and I like to be involved. I like to be involved in all the all the processes we have. I mean, I when we have new ideas, I like to be involved, especially technically. I'm going to step back. What I do less is organization wise, technically or design wise that's what I like to be involved in. You still enjoy it? Oh, I love it. Yeah. People ask me always, when are you going to retire? I said, what is retiring? Oh, you do what you want to do. If that is retirement, I'm retired for 40 years. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, and you hear that a lot from people in, in business. Um, it's, and, and for me, I mean, I've, I started in business very young, and I, I don't, after about three days off, I go, okay, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I can walk around, <laughs> but uh, like I, I, I like hobbies. I like being rushed in my hobbies. I like to do it for a couple hours, but then I got to get back to work. Um, for you though, over the years, have you developed hobbies and ways to sort of, it, since 87, that's a long time to yeah. make tough decisions and manage capital and people. And I'm sure there's been some, you know, success and failure along the way. Do, how do you sort of manage that for the long haul the way you have? It- it's interesting. You have to develop certain hobbies, and my hobbies are really strange because what I'm as a hobby, I'm racing cars. Oh yeah. And to do so, when you do this, you have to forget that you have a wife. You have to forget that you have a company. If you own that car, you have only one thought, and that is kind of for me. It's an easy part. I have to think only about driving. I don't have to think about finances. I don't have to think about do we get this job or do we have this. I only have to think about one thing, mm-hmm. and that is relaxing. Even so, you're under high stress because I'm very competitive to win that race, but that is what what the relaxation is for me. Yeah, that's a great. I I personally I use boxing because okay. <laughs> If you get hit in the face, you forget everything. And then sometimes it doesn't come back. That's the only problem with that sport. <laughs> um, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining the show. It, it really um, it really was a pleasure. And the, the one thing I will say, a, a different companies just have different sort of things. There's definitely a passion. Uh, sometimes when I do these interviews, I sort of drag... But I'm watching all three of you on a monitor, and I can see all three of you wanting to jump in on the conversation. Um, and that makes it for a much funner interview for me personally, um, that, to just see that it's a company that's passionate. I mean, here, our business is built around being passionate about heavy industry. Um, so it makes it a lot more fun when the people we have on are as well. So I, I really thank you for not just coming on, but also engaging in the way you have. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Jared. Thank you. It's thank a you. pleasure. Thank you.
And thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, this is, we've got, mul I, I wish I could remember if there was three, uh, we're doing three more or two more with Centrisis, um, but we are doing more episodes. This is part of a series. Um, over time, if you're seeing this maybe, you know, six months after release, there will be links to the other episodes in the description. So make sure to check those out, and we'll be covering different points about the company. Um, and, of course, we'll have links to Centrisis and CNP, and, and even if you want to connect with uh, the people you've seen on the show today through LinkedIn, we'll have their links as well in the description. Thank you everybody for watching. We'll see you on the next episode of The Crownsman Show.